Okay, we are live. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to the D Hypno program. I think this is episode 13, and it goes to the Free World FM. So you can check that out. A lot of great hosts. And this will be Friday, April 12th. And this discussion or this episode is based on a post I made on Twitter X about connections to the book Catcher in the Rye. And I wrote something named three killers who were associated with the book, The Catcher in the Rye. And people responded. People got it right. There were three that uh, popped up, and I'll discuss them in uh, this episode. But it was Mark David Chapman, uh, David, what is it? Uh, that's the guy who shot Reagan. And uh, John Bro Robert John Bardo. John Hinckley. Robert John Bardo was the person who shot Rebecca Schaefer. All, I thought of those as all the people who had the book, copy of the book. I was wrong because uh, Lee Harvey Oswald also had it. So it was actually four people. So I asked a question with four correct answers, not three. And then Lisa Solis, uh, who I've been on the occult re rejects with, sent me a really great article. I'm going to read from it. And the title of that article is How the Catcher in the Rye is Linked to JFK, John Lennon. And Rebecca Schaefer. And for people who don't recall, Rebecca Schaefer was uh, kind of a rising actress in Hollywood. And this guy Bardo kind of tracked her down, down and shot her in her front door. He was also interested in somebody else. I think it was Madonna. But uh, it is featured in common culture as well. So this is kind of the strange occurrence of Catcher in the Rye has bled into common culture. And you see it in, in The Shining. You see it in Mel Gibson's Conspiracy Theory. And I'll show that. And then I'm going to read from The Murder of John Lennon. I think it's by Fenton Bresler. who goes in detail about Chapman. And also did a show with uh, about mind games. And that was with an author of that. I've done an episode. Author is David Whelan. That just book just was released in 2024 so i've got some stuff i'll start out with this kind of amusing reference to this phenomenon in south park so this is butters so i'll just play this real quick kill john lennon kill john lennon kill john lennon kill john lennon hey dad where does john lennon live john lennon's dad butters Ah, dang it. So that's kind of amusing. So there's a picture of Mark David Chapman pointed to his head, which, uh, in my opinion, was clearly tampered with. And this is the article I just men mentioned. The author's name is Silke Yasso, J-A-S-S-O. I think it's Yasso. And then here's a picture of from Conspiracy Theory, Mel Gibson, and what's her name is holding the book catcher on the rye i guess he buys it and this is from the kind of the opening sequence sean uh mccann sent this to me and you see in the kind of weird blue and red outfits both of them have she's reading catcher on the rye in a more it seems like be like a breakfast situation but uh yeah it's interesting to see how annoyed, how paranoid uh, Kubrick was. He knew a lot. He seemed to know a lot. So that's interesting. There's also a reference to Catcher in the Rye, Night Ranger, kind of an 80s hair band. I'm going to read from this too. This is uh, Joe Atwell's The Freemason in the Rye. And for people who don't know, like the history of Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, it was kind of a banned book. Like people thought it was um, very salacious, and it kind of was for that time. Uh, Holden Caulfield, people identified with Holden Caulfield, the main character who thought everybody was a phony, and there's themes of pedophilia and with, with him and his sister. I think he had a 10-year-old sister, but also people like touching his head. And we'll go into that. It's uh, But also this kind of initiatory thing. I think uh, Joe Atwell is correct in this regard, and we can go into that. But there's also this kind of weird kind of liminal mind control element in that. Like, there's a statement in the book. This is a people shooting hat, I said. I shoot people in this hat. It's like, 
it's almost like cat in the hat like rhythms and stuff very strange here's mind games i'll, I'll try to put a uh, link to this episode i did with david Whelan. i don't think he keys into the catcher in the rye as much but and here's the book i'm going to reference murder of john lennon benton bresler and we'll go into the kind of these screenshots later um but i really would like to read from silke yasso's uh, article which kind of ties all of these cases together so again her article is how the catcher on the rise linked to jfk john lennon and rebecca schaefer this she published it about a year ago and this is from rare.us i'll put a link to this this in the show notes Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger is one of the most popular and highly controversial novels in history. It has been referred to by some as the Bible of Teenage Angst. Let's see. The Bible of Teenage Angst. On the surface, it is a book about a young man peering onto the innocence of childhood to shirk the dissatisfactory phoniness of adulthood. It was simultaneously one of the most taught books in schools and heavily censored. From the early, <clears throat> excuse me, early 1960s to 1980s. In some school districts, it made their banned books list. To add to the book's controversy, it has since been found in the possession of some of the most infamous murders or attempted murders of high-profile American figures, causing the conspiracy theories that it is a trigger for sleeper assassins. That's right. One of the greatest pieces of literary work is rumored to be used by the United States government to murder people. I've literally been scrabbling the internet floor for weeks and praying the FBI doesn't come to my door over this one. J.D. Salinger was a bestseller with The Catcher in the Rye. He immediately followed his success, strangely, by becoming a hermit. He'd started writing the book in its youngest form, a short story called The Boy in the People's Shooting Hat. Interesting. It eventually became three to seven chapters three to seven of the novel when he was in Berlin serving in World War II or just under the year military intelligence, by the way. He took the book with him when he checked himself into a mental hospital post-war. Some think that the book and his alienation were a way for him to cope with something like PTSD, common for soldiers, soldiers as we know now. This is why the book is thought to be heavily autobiographical. Written from the point of view of a boy in a mental hospital, reflecting on a past time in his life when he was attending prep school and life was better than the present. Some say Salinger was trying to grasp for innocence, something he had lost, if at no other time during the war. Needless to say, many people and publishers were critical of his book and his mental stability, and maybe they should have been. But then again, maybe he shouldn't not have been. First, let's look at the murders, the murders of coincidence. Mark David Chapman will forever be known as the man who got an autograph from Beatles founding member John Lennon hours before he supposedly shot and killed him. Yeah, these guys are all patsies. Maybe not uh, the guy who shot. Bardo probably wasn't, but Chapman and Hinckley were, I don't think, the shooters. <clears throat> Chapman had the book on him that night. He didn't have it. We'll go into detail. Fenton Brens Bresler covers it very well. And inside the book, he scrawled his own inscriptions the way an author does when they dedicate it to someone. He simply said, this is my statement. Upon police arrival at the scene of the shooting and arresting him for shooting Lennon, he reportedly told the police, I'm sure the big part of me is Holden Caulfield, who is the main person in the book. The small part of me must be the devil. So then another John. The interesting thing about Chapman and Hinckley together is like they traveled far to get to the East Coast for their victims. It's very strange, and I'll, we'll be reading about that uh, a lonely mid-20 John Hinckley Jr., who was said to be obsessed with the book, and John Lennon, he believed that without Lennon, the world was over. Some say he wanted to commit suicide by being killed in the Secret Service and earn notoriety in the process by taxi driver actress Jodie Foster. Act actress Rebecca Schaefer was shot by Robert John Bardo at her apartment home in Los Angeles in 1989. Bardo was a former straight-A student turned dropout who was obsessed with the actress and had been stalking her for about three years. When he visited her apartment complex, she turned him down. He returned the same day. He knocked her on her door and shot her when she answered. The catcher in the rye was in his possession when he killed her, but he tossed the book onto the roof of another building a few blocks away. Strange how some of these very highly competent people suddenly turn insane. Very strange. Lee Harvey Oswald. The infamous Lee Harvey Oswald, the man charged in JFK, another Patsy, <clears throat> JFK's murder also had connect connections to his book in a raid of his dallas apartment following the assassination 
Catcher in the Rye, along with the books like George Orwell's Animal Farm and Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, were found, right? Good placement, right? Uh, spent time in a ju juvenile reformatory. Um, he had psychological assessment. Dr. Hartog's detected a personality pattern disturbance with schizoid features and passive aggressive tendencies. So that's a few things she goes into. I don't want to read her whole article. She goes into the Manchurian candidate um, and then dabbling in psychosis and mind control. There's a line in chapter 21 of the J.D. Salinger book that could be plainly be pointing to the use of hypnotization and mind control. It reads, it's funny. All you have to do is say something nobody understands and they'll do practically anything you want them to do. The statement can be received twofold. For one, the act of inducing mind control via hypnosis, in some theories, the phrase model psychosis is used instead, and subliminal messages are never overt. Hence the name. They're often something someone cannot understand or even recognize as happening. The implanted thought seems to have come from one's own psyche. And would someone with mental illness actually be easier to manipulate? This is how is this how they choose subjects? This is something to consider. Regardless, once they have been conditioned to kill their target, they have their mission and are ready to kill, especially once they are activated or come into contact again with the trigger subliminal message. Maybe this also sheds light some light as to why both Mark David Chapman and John Hinckley Jr. behaved so strangely once killing their target. Chapman was found reading the book, and Hinckley was still trying to shoot the gun that he had emptied of bullets. Hmm, strange. Kind of like Sirhan Sirhan. It's weird how they're all similar. And patsies, right? Most assassins killing uh, people of such high stature don't kill their targets so publicly or stick around at the scene of the crime. But if these were, in fact, in fact man, they're Manchurian candid patsies, guys. That's that's a different. That's what these people all get wrong. What? Yeah, J.D. Salinger's looking pretty crazy there. What ties J.D. Salinger to any of this? Since many believe the novel to be autobiographical. It can be seen as the author is talking about his experience in the Army, which is where they say he started the book. J.D. Salinger spent a year in the U.S. Army in 1942. It consisted of two phases. Initially, his job was to interrogate captured Nazis with the CIC Counterintelligence Corps, an intelligence sector responsible for providing security for military installations and staging areas located enemy agents and acted to counter stay-behind networks. He also provided training to combat units in security censorship, the seizure of documents, and the dangers of booby traps. Toward the end of the, his year, CIC joined Operation Paperclip. This was a tight-lipped operation that involved the U.S. recruiting over 1,600 Nazi scientists, engineers, and technicians to help us win the race with the Soviet Union to win the space race since the Cold War was looming. Years later, the Project Paperclip would give way to other more, let's call them morally sticky projects. So then he goes, she goes through Project Chatter, Project MK Ultra, Bluebird and Artichoke. I've gone through that. Connected Dots. Um, but yeah, it's a good article. I think it's uh, pretty apt. And so I, I recommend that. But then there's kind of like At Will's book. Let me see. Freemason in the Rye. So he kind of goes into this. This is Joe At Will's website is post flaviana.org i'll read just a little bit of this jd salinger's catcher in the rise a work with many mysteries attached to it perhaps the least of which is that though it is both incoherent and morally destructive it has been force-fed by america's public school system to america's adolescence for 60 years a mystery more often cited by the public press however has been the book's association with assassinations. In fact, among the assassins purportedly in possession of Catcher in the Rye were three of the most famous, Mark David Chapman, John Hinckley, Lee Harvey Oswald. I'll just about kind of move forward. Studying the Egyptians for 28 days. The Catcher in the Rye describes many secrets. For example, the book begins with the central character, Holden Caulfield, noting, quote, my parents would have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father, unquote. The central secret of Catcher in the Rye is the identity of the secret fraternity that Holden Caulfield was a member of. Quote, and they had this goddamn secret fraternity that I was too yellow not to join, unquote. To learn the identity of the secret fraternity, a reader must recognize that Salinger is using the cryptic style of typology 
used to create the Gospels and the Shakespearean literature of Lots of Speed. Catcher in the Rye is especially difficult to decode because the framework of much of it is based upon the initiation rites of the Freemasons and are often secret, secret and not may not be uniform from one lodge to another. The first typological, typological clue Salinger provides to the identity of the secret society is given in a scene at the beginning of the book where Caulfield is discussing his grade with his history teacher, Mr. Spencer, who states that Caulfield studied the Egyptians for 28 days, right? That's a direct eye to masonry. And then failed to test about the subject. Quote, we studied the Egyptians from November 4th to December 2nd, he said. You chose to write about them for the optional essay question. Would you care to hear what you had to say? No, sir, not very much, I said. While the symbolism is oblique, once a reader adopts the correct interpretive framework, the meaning is transparent. The secret fraternity is the Freemasons, and the 28 days spent studying the Egyptians refers to the period of studying a candidate. Studying a candidate must spend between the time of his initiation as an entered apprentice to the time he takes the exam to become a second-degree Mason. So that's just kind of one of the Masonic views. Holden begins to learn the truth and hints that he may be moving on to the next level. Quote, do you feel absolutely no concern for your future, boy? Response, oh, I feel some concern for my future, all right. Sure, sure I do. I thought about it for a minute, but not too much, I guess. Not too much, I guess. That's like hypnotic, too. This response, these uh, same responses over and over is very much uh, hypnotic induction. Induction, like, you will, old Spencer said. You will, boy. You will when it's too late. And like, Spencer kind of goes back i think it goes back to um freemasonry in scotland scottish right i didn't like hearing him say that i made me sound dead or something it was very depressing i guess i will i said the fact that his teacher makes holden feel dead at this point indicates that holden has moved to the third degree of freemason initiation in which the candidate is made to imitate the death of hiram abiff during his initiation so there's just all kinds of quotes in here that are very sus, but uh, that's just one thing. And I'll put, I'll try to put references to all this stuff. But Atwill also kind of go call it has another article called a pet, a pedophile fantasy in the rye, and I'll try to read from that as well. Let me see if I can pull that up. Go through. I'm, I'm not going to read all these. I'll put. I'll try to put references in them. So. Again, Joe Atwell, Jerry Russell, August 2015. A pedophile fantasy in the rye. In a prior article available on the site, J.D. Salinger's book, The Catcher in the Rye, was shown to contain a hidden symbolic level that depicted Holden Caulfield's initiation into the Freemasons. The article also showed that Salinger described a kind of Freemasonry that did not shy away from violence to protect its secrets. Will Weaver, blogging at the Huffington Post, noticed another disturbing fact about J.D. Salinger's literature. Quote, as we pass the two-year anniversary of J.D. Salinger's death, why is it that no one remarks on the obvious? In his life and in his fiction, Salinger had a predilection for young girls and women that, at least from a 21st century lens, does not seem all that healthy, unquote. The first story in Salinger's collection, Nine Stories, includes a scene at a beach with a young man in his 20s and a little girl. She is described as wearing a two-piece bathing suit that she would not be needing for nine or ten years. That's slightly creepy coming from a grown guy. But he knows her by name, and our inner parents, parent lets out a sigh of relief until he compliments her again on her bathing suit. Soon he is holding her hand as they walk further down the beach where they go swimming together, and in an intensely described scene, he helps her float by holding her ankles. So that's kind of ties into this pedophile theme of Kubrick, and the shining too right so that's another thing it's also how weird like when uh torrance jack torrance is holding that uh men's magazine too and in, in the shining there's a subtext of pedophilia in the shining that's a whole nother show i'm not going to read these all in, in detail and if you look closely at catcher in the ride there are odd moments of holden watching the skater or sitting in his young sister's bedroom holden with his gray hair remember it is an existentialist reading in full critical flower when Salinger was publishing and still fragrant in his work today, forgives almost anything. It's all about alienation, his fans maintain. Okay, but these facts remain. About 75% of Salinger's fiction centers on characters under the age of 21, and of that, about half on girls under the age of 12. 
Unfettered by existentialist pleasantries, we would like to put Salinger's alienation into a more post-Flavian context. Our suggestion is that Salinger's encrypted message needs to be understood as a consequence of his being a member of military intelligence during World War II. So then he goes into MK Ultra CA, counterculture, NLP, neuro linguistic programming, which is that same thing. We just saw that repetition, right? Um, and this is Bates, and I've talked to that with Uter. Trying to get together a thing on Norbert. Um, I forgot his last name. Gordon Wasson, I've covered that with uh, Morse Allen episodes and things like that. So these uh, kind of shows that I'm doing for the dehypno program overlap. So you can check those out. Yes, Robert, these will be on Apple Podcasts. I will put that up uh, when I'm done. It's probably going to be a two-part because I haven't gotten through anything. Holden and Phoebe, best of friends. On a surface, surface level, the relationship between the 16-year-old Holden Caulfield and his 10-year-old sister Phoebe appears to be a strong and affectionate brother-sister bond, which has generally been praised by critics. However, under closer scrutiny, Holden and Phoebe express feelings and actions for each other, which are well along the slippery slope that leads to incest and pedophilia. This would help set the stage for the baby boomers' acceptance of the free love and no marriage culture of the 60s. Salinger begins his assault on his male reader's subconscious by having his anti-hero state that he is a sex maniac and describing sexual activity designed to open his reader's subconscious to sub such behavior. Holden admits that he would do some very crumby stuff if the opportunity came up. What teenage boy wouldn't? Quote, for trub the trouble was this that this kind of junk is sort of fascinating to watch, even if you don't want it to be. For instance, that girl that was getting water squirted all over her face, she was pretty good looking. I mean, that's my big trouble. In my mind, I'm probably the biggest sex maniac you ever saw. Sometimes I can think of very crumby stuff I wouldn't mind doing if the opportunity came up. I can even see how it might be quite a lot of fun in a crumby way. And if you were both sort of drunk and all, to get a girl and squirt water or something all over each other's face. So it goes in. Yeah, this is pretty. Uh, I keep making up these sex rules for myself. Then I break them right away. Well, Madonna whore complex. So there's a lot of things. I mean, just going through the themes of Catcher in the Rye is another thing. But I really kind of came at Catcher in the Rye in the context of these assassinations. But I should probably reach out to Joe out. We'll see if he's interesting, interested in doing a show. But yeah, so let's go back to kind of, I'm going to read from this book, The Murder of John Lennon from Fenton Bresler. And it just goes kind of into the detail of Chapman and what Chapman was really up to, kind of leading up to the crime. And this murder of John Lennon, the section is Mind Control, page 44, and some famous names pop up, John Gittinger, who I've done a show with, but uh, and Klein, right? So it's good. Uh, let's see. Marx himself quotes Milton Klein, a New York psychologist and former president of the American Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, who has served as an unpaid consultant on CIA hypnosis research is saying that the idea of creating a real-life Manchurian candidate is not impossible. It cannot be done by everyone, said Klein. It cannot be done consistently, but it can be done. Klein incidentally served for a while as an expert witness for the defense in the case of Mark David Chapman. There seems little doubt that sophisticated techniques have now reached the stage where, if murder is desired, a killer, once programmed and on hold, can be triggered into action by a phone call or by use of a particular book, such as perhaps happened to Mark Chapman with The Catcher in the Rye, or by a hypnotic session, which, as did happen to Candy Jones for 12 years whenever she was needed as a courier, if necessary with built-in memory loss for after the event. If this seems far-fetched, it can only counter that way back in the early days of MKUltra in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Hypnotically induced amnesia had already been brought to such a point that one senior CIA official was alleged to have wanted to advance it to the stage of seeing whether it would stand up to torture. Fellow CIA official John Gittinger told John Marks that, as far as he knew, this devilish experiment, torturing your own human guinea pig, was not carried it out. Carried out. I still like to think we were human beings enough that this was not something we played with, he said. So that's Gittinger and MKUltra. It's interesting that this, that... Uh, 
this character, Fenton Bresler, actually got all this information together. So then I'm going to read from uh, the Section 2 Mind Control and go into some of these other. I mean, a lot of the, if you've listened to my stuff, you've kind of gone over a lot of this information. Sirhan Sirhan, JFK, RFK. Uh, maybe I shouldn't go through all these details, but I, I think this book is worth reading. But here's the section, How Is It Done, page 53. How do you convert a law-abiding, God-fearing, as in Mark Chapman's case, individual into a murderer? It's really quite simple. You catch him young or at his most vulnerable. Two often go together. You work your way into his confidence, perhaps under the guise of some benevolent, paternalistic organization to which you both belong. You flatter him. You make him feel important, set aside for a special mission that can only, only he can accomplish. You subject him to hypnosis, with or without the help of drugs, which with many youngsters these days, will not be all that difficult to tempt him to try. Then you keep him under surveillance, watched by close friends whose, quote, advice, unquote, or helpful suggestions he readily accepts. If necessary, for a while, you take him off to a totally alien setting, say Lebanon in the middle of a civil war, where he's both disoriented for the first time in his life and also blooded by close contact with the stench of human destruction. These are all similarities, Surian, Surian, Chapman. These are all young guys too, right? 24, youngish, 24, 25. You do not rush at it. You keep him on hold for months, even years. But he is always there, ready to be triggered for action. And once alerted, you never let him relax. You maintain the pressure. You do not let him off the hook of his own inner torment. The telephone rings. He picks it up. A familiar voice says, do it, do it, do it, and rings off. The phone rings again. You are holding Caulfield. You are holding Caulfield. You are holding Caulfield, says the same voice in dry monotone. He returns home to find a note waiting for him pinned to the front door. Lennon is a phony. Lennon is a phony. Lennon is a phony. The telephone rings in the middle of the night. He wakes up, reaches for the receiver, and hears, Catcher, catcher, catcher. You are the catcher in the rye of this generation. He dials an outside call, and the same voice butts in, Kill the phony, kill the phony, kill the phony. He never knows when he is next going to hear the voice, that voice on the telephone which soon becomes almost indistinguishable from that other voice, which is now inside his head, repeating relentlessly the same pattern of phrases. And when it is over and the man he has shot is lying dead at his feet, he is at peace. He has achieved his destiny. Some may even claim he has only done it to make himself famous. So the buildup to murder. <clears throat> and this is page 92. I'm kind of skipping forward. There was the mysterious affair of the cassette recorder with about 14 hours of Beatles tapes that, according to some newspaper reports at the time, Mark was supposed to have had on him when he was arrested, and which, according to other reports, he was supposed to have listened to while waiting for Lennon and Yoko to return to the Dakota. Does not that show he was an avid fan, at least of the Beatles, if not Lennon? It might perhaps do so if the recorder and tapes existed. Steve Spiro, the New York policeman who arrested Mark, has given me a list of the objects that Mark had on him when he took him into police custody. It includes Mark's copy of The Catcher in the Rye, the key of his New York hotel room, and his Bank of Hawaii visa card. But there's no cassette recorder listed and no tapes of any kind, not of the Beatles nor of anyone else. This is legend created from the mind of some imaginative reporter not bothered too much about truth getting in the way of a good story. So he did have a copy uh, in his hands. The second popular misconception about Mark relates to J.D. Salinger's famous novel, The Catcher in the Rye. The theory is, is that he had always identified himself with Holden Caulfield, the book's phony-hating 16-year-old hero, ever since he first read Catcher at the same age. After all, this is the book that the amazed New York policeman found him quietly reading outside the Dakota when he had thrown down his gun immediately after supposedly killing Lennon, with the inscription inside the cover written by Mark, to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield. This is my statement. In his prison cell awaiting trial, he maintained, quote, the reason I killed John Lennon was to gain prominence to promote the reading of J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. I'm not saying I'm a messiah or anything like that. If you read the book and if you understand my past, you will see that I am indeed the catcher in the rye of this generation. Some people critique me for saying that Chapman was obsessed with The Catcher in the Rye. He was obsessed. 
Millions of people have heard those words spoken in Mark's flat, emotionless voice, only slightly tinged with a Southern accent. In Kevin Sims' British television do documentary, The Man Who Shot John Lennon, transmitted on both sides of the Atlantic on February 1988. This has come become one of the accepted and I believe profoundly erroneous motivations for the murder. Catcher is a very impressive book. It, re it is required reading in many American schools as a prime example of the country's mid 20th century literature, a crusade against phoniness, one American critic has called it. The character of Holden, driven to near despair by what he sees as a depravating hypocrisy of the adult world, has struck a chord with untold numbers of young readers in both Britain and America. Perhaps that is why it is one of the most banned books by local ordinances in some parts of the United States, just because it is so dangerously subversive for receptive young minds. But that does not alter the fact that until shortly before the murder, as we shall see later, Mark seems to have forgotten all about the fact that in his teens he had read the book. Despite the hordes of journalists from all around the world who descended on Decatur after Lennon's murder, and the many telephone calls that must have been made to lo local stringers in nearby Atlanta by anguished news editors attempting to cover every possible angle of the story. Not one of Mark's ex-schoolmates or teachers has ever been quoted as saying anything about the book or Mark's alleged involvement in it, let alone his identification with its main character. The only reference to Catcher that I've found is not by a school friend, but by Vince Smith, a senior official at the South DeKalb YMCA in his con contribution to Kevin Sims' documentary. He said he knew Mark quite well and continued, quote, he tended to have grand ideas, passions that would, and that would stick with him. Then one day he'd be gone and another would come by. I felt that the catcher business was one of Mark's passions. I, I didn't see anything in there that made me think it a more serious passion than another book. In fact, I figured that maybe next week he'd have another book and he'd be trying to get everybody to read. He certainly didn't seem like Holden Caulfield to me. Albert Goldman, in his biography of Lennon, takes a view fundamentally out of line with the evidence. Quote, just as Thomas Akempis titled his famous work of devotion, The Imitation of Christ, so Mark David Chapman might have titled his autobiography in Im Imitation of Catcher. For from the age of 18, in fact 16, when he discovered this famous rendering of modern youth, Chapman had discovered one similarity after another between his life and that of Holden Caulfield. At first glance, the parallels between the fictitious preppy from a classy wasp family and the suburban small boy, mall boy are far from obvious. But if you scrape off the surface and focus on their core personalities in the cardinal episodes of their lives, you soon see why this book became Chapman's private Bible. Unquote. I do not see that at all, even apart from one essential difference between Holden and Mark ignored by Goldman. Quote, that Holden was very close to his younger sister Phoebe and wanted to protect her in particular from the world's phonies, whereas Mark was never close to his younger sister Susan, who, like his parents, has never even chosen to visit him in prison. If one is going in for supposition, I prefer to speculate on the possibility that knowing that Mark had, like many other young Americans, been impressed by reading Catcher at a formative age in his mid-teens, those who programmed him to shoot Lennon as the ultimate phony worked assiduously by at putting into his mind the conviction that he was, in some twisted way, the real-life embodiment of Holden, the fictitious young crusader against phonies. What better split personality could you, have, could you have for the victim of your programming? I say victim for, if I am right, Mark David Chapman is, in many ways, as much of the victim of those who wanted to kill John Lennon as Lennon himself. Skipping forward to 139. Yet undoubtedly, as the hot Pacific sun of August came to the islands, Mark was going through some kind of inner crisis. He nearly walked out on his $4 an hour job because there had been a break-in at 444 Nahua Street, and he thought about his employers. He thought that his employers held him to blame. He was upset and angry about it. Fiuay Leva had to talk to him like a brother to persuade, persuade him to stay on, but he transferred to the maintenance division rather than continue as a security guard. It was clearly a difficult time for him, and now an ominous new factor came into his life. He became interested in the catcher and the rye. We do not know why. We do not know if anyone suggested it to him, and if so, who? 
Catcher is a book that most people read once in their lifetime in their teens, and that is it. Why on earth, seemingly out of the blue, did Mark suddenly get so involved in a book that, like most of his generation of young Americans, had all he had already read before at school nearly 10 years earlier? Whatever the reason, whoever his controller may have been, if he had one, however, however the message got through to him, he threw himself spiritedly into the book. He bought two paperback copies, one for Gloria and one for himself. He even called himself a 25-year-old catcher. Strange timing for, by August 1980, the battle lines in the upcoming U.S. presidential elections in November had clearly had been clearly drawn. As far back as the end of May, Ronald Reagan had been assured of a convention majority as a Republican candidate. And although the Democratic convention did not take place until August itself, Jimmy Carter, the incumbent Democratic president, had also long been certain of his party's nomination. So it's happening in the context of this thing and ties in with uh, ties in with Hinckley. Furthermore, since the middle of June, Reagan had overtaken Carter in the Gallup and other polls. And at the beginning of August, his ascendancy peaked to an all-time high. Apart from two brief intervals, he was to maintain, remain consistently ahead, albeit by only a slight margin until voting day itself. So it is absolutely too far-fetched. So is it absolutely too far-fetched to contemplate that there may have been a connection between these two events. Reagan emerging as frontrunner in the election stakes and Mark now picking up catcher again, with the further coincidence of Lenin striding back with renewed vigor into the hit factory in Manhattan to record his comeback album, Double Fantasy. If catcher with its explosive effect on Mark was indeed the trigger for his program mind, serving to put him on alert in case of call, it all does seem to come together with a remarkable neatness. And then I'll skip forward here. Uh, by contrast, the second half of August and the whole of September 1980 continued to be a bad time for Mark. He was not really happy in his job. He felt even worse off doing less satisfactory work than in Atlanta before he ever came to Hawaii. What had he achieved in the past four years? It seemed precious little. He was now even questioning his firm religious faith. It was a kind of ironic that I could encourage my wife and give her specific directions as to how she could grow in her Christian faith and commitment in terms of reading the Bible and studying the Bible. He later told Reverend Charles McGowan, right? He pops up in mind games. His former pastor at his South DeKalb Presbyterian Church. And at the same time, I wasn't doing it. McGowan had really heavy uh, military intelligence ties. He's still alive. The catcher in the ride that he had been just again read for the first time in six years began to exert its baleful influence. If his controller was triggering him into action by suggesting that he reread this book, he could not have chosen a better fictitious character for Mark to identify with than young Holden Caulfield. Not only did Holden's relationship with his non-interfering mother and coldly distant father strike chords in Mark's own childhood, the book as a whole seemed almost written for the purpose. Soon after its original publication in the summer of 1951, Ernest Jones, Sigmund Freud student and eventual biographer, had described it in a review as a case history of all of us. It was, he wrote, not at all something rich and strange, but what every sensitive 16-year-old since Rousseau has felt, and of course what each of us is certain he has felt. When Mark was himself was 16, he had been too juvenile to appreciate it, too involved in the circumstances of his own young life. But now, nine years later, its effect was almost instant. It was not only Holden's almost pathological dislike for phonies, it was also his ambivalent attitude to violence that rang bells for Mark. If anyone had tried to trigger him on a James Bond or modern-day Rambo sort of character, they would have got nowhere. Pseudo-macho aggressiveness, or even the real thing, was not Mark's style. He was the young man who vacillated between revulsion at the Arkansas hunter's rifle stacked at the back of a truck driver's cabin when he was out with David Moore and engrossment with Gene Scott's white-handled revolver when he came to collect him at Fort Chaffee. By temperament, Mark was contemplative and introspective rather than a dynamic man of action. He was nearer in field to the self-doubting Hamlet, compelled almost despite himself to kill his uncle and avenge his father's foul murder, 
than to being a sort of real life version of Charles Bronson in some death wish kind of movie, killing people almost as if he enjoyed it. The imbalance in the psychological makeup of immature 16-year-old Holden Caulfield exactly suited the temperament and be of bewildered, unhappy 25-year-old Mark Chapman. Nowhere is this better exemplified than in the passage towards the end of Catcher when Holden, visiting his beloved younger sister Phoebe's, Phoebe's school in an abortive attempt to talk with her, sees the words F.U. written on a wall. Quote, it drove me damn near crazy. I thought how Phoebe and all the other little kids would see it and how they wonder what the hell it meant. And then finally some dirty kid would tell them. I kept wanting to kill whoever would written it. I figured it was some perverty bum that sneaked in the school late at night and then wrote it on the wall. I kept picturing myself catching him at it and how I'd smash his head on the stone steps till he was good and goddamn dead and bloody. But I knew too I wouldn't have the guts to do it. That made me even more depressed. But a few lines later, despite his fears, he erases the offending F.U. That was exactly the way Mark would soon respond to his special mission to kill John Lennon, a phrase that he later used to his ex-pastor, the Reverend Charles McGowan. Like Holden, Mark would show anger, determination, then doubts, followed by fear, anxiety, and finally definitive action, rubbing out John Lennon. So then moving forward... In truth, Mark had gotten Lennon, Lennon mentally in his sights weeks before Lawrence Shames' article appeared, and it was a book, not a magazine feature, that did the job. Just as he had suddenly become involved again in August 1980 with The Catcher in the Rye, he equally suddenly and mysteriously thereafter recovered interest in Lennon, whom, as with Holden Caulfield, he had not thought about for nearly the past 10 years. I can be specific about the chronological order, Catcher and then Lennon through another book, because this vital piece of hitherto unpublished cross-examination on 24th of August, 1981, when Mark was finally sentenced in New York Supreme Court for Lennon's murder, this part of the proceedings was not open to the public, but a written record of the cross-examination appears in the prosecution's confidential brief in Mark's subsequent appeal that has been made available to me by Alan Sullivan, the assistant district attorney in charge of the case. Sullivan is cross-examining Dr. Daniel Schwartz, the principal defense psychiatrist, question. As a matter of fact, did you learn that Chapman's interest in John Lennon largely stemmed from his reading of a book in Hawaii during either September or October of 1980? Answer, yes. Question, have you ever read that book? Answer, no. Question, have you ever seen it? Answer, no. Question, or any copy of it? Answer, no. Question, did you learn that the defendant said that at or about the time that he was reading that book, he felt, gee, wouldn't it be funny? Wouldn't it be a kicker if I killed John Lennon? Said that to himself, words to that effect? Answer, yes, I believe so, yes. If Catcher was the trigger in Mark's program mind, alerting him to the danger of the world's phonies, then this unnamed other book, perhaps suggested to him by his controller, pointed him in the right direction. I can name the book. It was Anthony Fawcett's John Lennon One Day at a Time. Although it was written by someone who's clearly an admirer of Lennon, it also showed the style and wealth in which he lived. And paradoxically, in the circumstances, how he had retired from active involvement in radical politics in the face of the Nixon administration's concerted, concerted efforts to deport him. Gloria Chapman told Jim Gaines that after Mark had brought this book home from the public library and read it, he would get angry that Lennon would preach love and peace but yet have millions. It completed the job started by the catcher in the rhyme. Mark was clearly going through torment. He told his perplexed wife that he was thinking of changing his name to Holden Caulfield. I didn't know that. On 10th of September, he actually wrote to a school teacher friend named Linda Irish, who had moved from Honolulu to New Mexico. Quote, I'm going nuts, unquote. He drew a picture of Diamond Head Mountain with the sun, moon, and stars above it and signed the letter, Quote, the catcher in the rye, Mark, unquote. Three years earlier, soon after he had arrived on the islands, he had had his long psychiatric sessions with Ann Jones, but she does not recall his ever have, having mentioned the book. It was certainly no big deal for him then, she says. So that's it. And then he was looking for money. Oh, that's interesting. So it's just a lot of quotes, like leading up to this killing. It's just catcher. I think he went to New York 
and then bought a copy of The Catcher in the Rye. Um, and there's these passages of Lenin talking. Let's see. This is him in New York. Mark had awakened at about 10.30, showered, and got himself ready for his grim task. task. He felt sure that somehow this would be the day when he achieved his destiny. He was prepared to wait all day, if necessary, outside the Dakota. And although the weekend's weather had been mild for the locals, he knew that it would be chill for his blood, used to used to the warm airs of Hawaii, seldom out of the 80s. So he pulled on thermal underwear before dressing himself in shirt, sweater, green trousers, and blue jacket. Then, after a last-minute adjustment to his most intimate personal possessions displayed on the bureau, he threw a green scarf around his neck, put on a dark olive green military-type overcoat, black imitation fur hat, and black wool gloves, and left the room. As he stood on the lift, descending the 27 floors to the entrance lobby, he patted comfortingly the loaded gun, snug and secure in his right-hand overcoat pocket. He came out of the lift, turned left, and almost ran down the five steps to 7th Avenue. As he walked the 20 blocks up to the Dakota on West 72nd Street, incong incongruous amid the lightly dressed New Yorkers with his heavy winter gear, he realized he was missing a prop. He had with him his double fantasy album, but something was missing. He halted his progress towards Lennon's selected place of execution and dived into a bookshop to emerge with a red paperback copy of The Catcher in the Rye. On the title page, he wrote, to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield, and below that, this is my statement. Arrived at the Dakota, he discovered from the doorman that Lennon, busy with his photo session, had not yet been seen that day. He waited around for a while. Then, with his usual eye for a pretty girl, he gave himself a break from duty. He invited two young girl fans hanging around the Dakota entrance to come and have lunch with him. Over a hamburger and two beers at a nearby coffee shop, he boasted about his journey around the world two years before. They were suitably impressed. Back at his post after lunch, he got to talking to Paul Goresh, a 21-year-old store detective and amateur photographer who sometimes hung around the Dakota in the hope of taking photographs of its star residents and their famous visitors that afterwards might he might sell. It was a busy afternoon. Lauren Bacall, Paul Simon, and Mia Farrow came by and Goresh's camera flashed. Then a station wagon pulled up with five-year-old Sean and his nanny. The girls knew him and screamed, oh, it's Sean. They introduced Mark, and he shook the limp hand of the little boy whose father he had come to kill. In between times, he opened his book and read from The Catcher in the Rye. So it's just, it's, it's everywhere. It's all over the story. He's carrying it around. He's talking about it. He knows he bought The Catcher in the Rye, so he mentions that in the book. Whatever the true explanation, on Sunday, the 1st of February, Mark sat down and wrote to the New York Times in ballpoint capitals a statement, which the newspaper printed eight days later. Seldom could a book that first appeared in paperback 17 years earlier have had such a glowing sales boost. Quote, this is from Mark Chapman. It is my sincere belief that presenting this written statement will not only stimulate the reading of J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, but will also help many to understand what has happened. If you were able to view the actual copy of The Catcher in the Rye that was taken from me on the night of December 8th, you could find it in the handwritten words, this is my statement. Unfortunately, I was able, unable to continue this stance and have since spoken openly with the police, doctors, and others involved in this case. I now fully realize that this should not have been done, for it removed the emphasis that I wanted to place on the book. My wish is for all of you to someday read The Catcher in the Rye. All of my efforts will now be devoted towards this goal, for this extraordinary book holds many answers. My true hope is that in wanting to find these answers, you will read The Catcher in the Rhyme. Thank you. Mark David Chapman, The Catcher in the Rhyme. For the first time, Mark now carried a copy of the book with him when he next appeared in court. The date was Thursday, 26th of February, and I was there myself in Justice Altman's court when he walked quickly in looking neither to the left nor to the right to sit beside Jonathan Marks with the now customary escort of armed guards. So he carried it in the court after the killing, too. He's just totally attached to this book. It's crazy. And then it goes on. So even through the year, he had it. On Monday, 24th, 1981, Mark David Chapman and his hair close cropped from the incident when, 
with Craig Kremen's help, he had totally shaved his head. So he shaved his head. It's a lot of like other mind control people. Walked into Justice Edwards' court under his usual heavy armed guard. He carried with him a copy of The Catcher on the Rye. He wore dark slacks and a light blue t-shirt with no jacket. One could clearly see the bulletproof vest. So he's carrying the catch of the rye to the murder, to his hearing, to his uh, trial. It's crazy. There's just all, and so it's in the trial too. It's in the trial extract. Let's see. This is district. What about Mark himself? He had spent several hours listening to other people talking about him. What did he have to say in his own defense? Asked if he had anything to say to the court before sentence was pronounced. This is at his sentencing. Mark opened his copy of The Catcher in the Rye and read an act extract to the hushed part 49. He had worked it out carefully. If you want to check it for yourself, it is to be found on page 173 of the Bantam paperback, the same edition that Mark had in court. Holden Caulfield is talking to his younger sister, Phoebe the only person in the world whom he really loves, about what he wants to be when he grows up. She suggests a lawyer like their father, but Holden dismisses lawyers as phonies. What he wants to be is a catcher in the rye, and he explains what he means in this passage cited by Mark David Chapman on his day of judgment. Quote, anyway, I keep picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field of rye, and all thousands of little kids, and nobody is around, nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some craggy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, they are running and they don't look where they are going. I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I do all day. I'd just be the catcher in the rye, unquote. Do you think anyone in court understood what he was saying, least of all the judge? I doubt it. Nothing was going to be permitted to raise these proceedings from the level of a humdrum. Justice Edwards had said back on June 22nd that if he received a good probation report, he would adopt what was really the easy way out of his sentencing dilemma and have the difference between the submissions of the prosecution and the defense. Choose 20 years at the minimum period to be served instead of 15 or 25. He got sentenced to 20 years uh, that day. So that's it. Um, and then I'll read from Hinckley too, right? So this is a book I found, Rawhide Down, Rendezvous from Destiny. And this is Hinckley's kind of adventure to D.C., much like uh, Chapman's Strange Travels and things like that. So this is about Hinckley. The following morning, he pondered suicide, a subject never far from his mind. Once he'd even tried to overdose on pills, but now he was imagining more creative and public ways to end his life. Recently, he'd become obsessed with a woman and begun thinking about how to stage a dramatic death in front of her. He also imagined killing her and then killing himself. He couldn't decide which scenario he preferred, but either way, he realized it was pointless to stay in Los Angeles. The woman was a college student in New Haven, Connecticut. He didn't know whether she would be willing to see him, especially since he had, she had brushed him off several times before, but it was worth the risk. On Thursday, March 26th, Hinkley packed his things at 11 a.m., he walked to the Greyhound bus station. He decided to travel first to Washington, D.C. He'd been there several times and was familiar with its downtown, then catch another bus to New Haven. His ticket cost $117. The four-day trip was a blur of fast food and brief stops. Las Vegas, Cheyenne, Chicago, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. Traveling through Utah, he awoke from a brief nap to find the bus hurtling through a massive snowstorm. He spent much of the trip slouched in a window seat, watching the scenery stream by, or reading The Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger's novel of teenage angst and alienation. He identified with the story's main character, Holden Caulfield, but the book was also special to him because he knew that John Lennon's assassin had pulled it from his pocket and leafed through it moments before gunning down the rock and roll icon. Lennon, who had been killed three and a, month, three and a half months earlier, was Hinckley's favorite musician. Even so, he sometimes felt that he identified more with Lincoln's killer, Lennon, excuse me, Lennon's killer, than with Lennon himself, interesting. So Hinckley knew about the catcher on the rye and, and uh, Chapman. A minister who boarded the Salt Lake City, boarded in Salt Lake City next, sat next to Hinckley for a day and a night as the bus traveled east. 
Hinckley told his seatmate that he was on vacation. Lying again, he claimed he was a college graduate and that he ran a record store in Los Angeles. When the minister asked him whether he was a Christian, Hinckley offered no reply. As the miles flowed by, Hinckley revealed few details about his life. He didn't even tell the minister his last name. Hinckley slept poorly during the trip. By the time he arrived in Washington on Sunday, March 29th, he was exhausted and hungry. He found a hotel, got some food, and spent another restless night. Now it was Monday morning and he had barely enough energy to get out of bed. He had a little over $129 left and he had managed to jam the jumbled detritus of his life into two suitcases. A plaid one, stacked neatly on his hotel's room's fold-out stand, was stuffed with an army field jacket, a black sports coat, a Best Western Road Atlas, two pairs of underwear, and some shirts, pants, and jeans. The suitcase also held some of his poems and short stories, as well as several of his favorite books. In addition to The Catcher in the Rye, Hinckley had brought along a copy of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in a book called Strawberry Fields Forever, John Lennon Remembers. Hinckley's distress was evident in some of the items he'd carried with him to Washington. Another of the books in the plaid suitcase was Ted Bundy, the killer next door. Interesting background there, too. So that's Hinckley carrying around these things. I mean, it's really just incredible, all, all these connections and uh, all these stories. But I think that that's kind of will do it. So that was kind of a discussion of Catcher in the Rye. And there's a whole other show just looking into Catcher in the Rye and all the themes in there. But in uh, their connection, right? So you've got these connections to all these deaths. You've got it, Lennon, Reagan, attempted killing of Reagan, um, this woman Schaefer, and JFK in Oswald. So that was, I think, episode 13 of the D-Hypno program. Thank you for listening.